Peace and blessings, family. What's up? It's all today. Jim is out there. Please live it. Don't sleep through this thing. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee Mugs and Conversations. Let's get into this conversation, y'all. Let go. <laughs> so we've been talking about the lost church. This is part four of the lost church. If you have not watched the last three, I encourage you to go back and watch those. I'll leave the link in the descriptions for those. Um, but let's go ahead and get into part four of the lost church. I'm not going to hold you guys up too long. So part four of the lost church, we're focusing on giving. I had a totally different topic I was going to talk about, but what's prompted me to talk about giving um, in regards to the lost church is last week, a, a, a I watched my news feed, news, my, my social media feed, like really blow up with a debate. Like, like people were like going at it, right? In regards to the topic of tithing, right? And, and, and I asked myself, what brought up this, this? I'm like, I'm seeing everybody just going back and forth, throwing scriptures at each other. Some ain't you even using scriptures. They're just talking. And I'm like, what in the world? Come to find out, it, it was prompted because Creflo Dollar, um, he, 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 did, he did, recently did a sermon to his church talking about and in, in, in saying that he was teaching the tithe wrong and the tithing for the church is unbiblical. Um, and he informed his church that if they got any type of sermons, any type of um, books where he was teaching about the tithes, any of his old material to burn it, throw it away. Don't listen to it no more and everything like that. And so this prompted people to talk about is Creflo Dollar turning from prosperity gospel preaching? And then it morphed into the full blown debate that I was seeing um, in, re in regards to is tithing mandatory for the church to do today or is tithing not mandatory um, for the church to do today? And I was going to make a comment about it, but I had to sit back and moisturize the situation and ask myself, when we're getting to talk about the concept of what the first century church did and what the church, the pattern the church should follow, or even the commands that the church should follow, it made me sit back and ask myself, well, what did the church do in that time frame? When we're reading the scriptures, what was the church doing? And I'm talking about the church after the day of Pentecost, after the first gospel message was preached by Peter, standing up amongst his fellow brothers and sisters who were Jews, and where 3,000 people were added to the body of Christ in one day off of one sermon on the day of Pentecost. That's the time frame I'm talking about moving forward. Forward. And when we look at what that church was doing, when we look at what the church was doing in the book of Acts, it, 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 it makes us look like dwarves staring at giants. When you read about, when you, when you just stop all the extra rah, 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 and you really read the book of Acts for what those individuals did and what they did even as they was enduring what they endured with persecution, how they spread like wildfire despite persecution, and how they took care of each other despite their circumstances, uh, it makes us look like the, the, the debate that we have about um, giving, the debate that we have about whether the tithe is mandatory or whether the tithe is not mandatory. It makes it look like children. It makes us look like children arguing over who's going to get the last scoop of ice cream. Let me give you some scriptural context real quick. If you go into the book of Acts chapter 2 and the book of Acts chapter 4, and you go down to the, 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 the ending of those chapters, right, around verses 35 in each, each one of them, 35, somewhere in there, in, in both of them, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, you'll see where these collective group of people was willing to sell their possessions in the effort to make sure that their fellow brothers and sisters were taken care of. Matter of fact, the scripture says they, 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 they sought to have all things common with each other. No man's possession they saw as their own. In fact, it goes on to even say that the grace of God was so powerful that nobody was in need. And from time to time, from time to time, they would sell land in houses, bring the money and set it at the apostles' feet and the apostles would, distri would distribute to those who was in need. I want you to think about that. While we're debating over whether 10% is mandatory or whether it's not mandatory, the, 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 the church I read about in the book of Acts was selling houses and land, 
I'm going to say that again. I want that to sink in. I just want that to sink in. I'm not I'm not getting involved in the tithe debate. Y'all can have that debate right there because Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, it's always been mind-boggling to me. But just hearing the, the childish chit-chattering debate, and I'm going to call it that, the, the, the chit-chat debate that, that we're having in regards to tithing when I read what the first century church was doing in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter four, it made me sit back and say, we, we, we really, we really need to grow up because these individuals weren't debating this. They was literally saying, I want to make sure that my people within the body of Christ, my fellow brothers and sisters are taken care of. And they were so overflowing with the grace of God. It was so powerful. The scripture says, this is the book. This is the Bible. This is the verses. It was so powerful. The grace of God inside them that they was willing to sell their houses and land because they saw everybody as having everything common. It's hard for us to clean out our closets, let alone sell property. It's hard enough for us to pull food out of the cabinet to give to a food drive. We'll give a can here and a can there, let alone some land, right? Let alone, like, if you got three vehicles and knowing good and darn well, you only need two. You're not giving up that third vehicle until you actually ran that sucker raggedy and you're ready to sell it off. You, those shoes, you're not ready to give them shoes off until you wore them suckers out. That that Those clothing, man, you got to actually get your good use out of them. You pay good money for them things, so you got to go ahead and make sure that the threads get stretched before you actually give it. These individuals was, like, out the gate. We got all things common. I'm about to sell what I got so to make sure that you are actually in, you're, you're not in need. And in fact, I'll go even further to sell land in housing in the effort to do it. After I read what was written in scripture about what the first century church was doing, it no longer looks like we're debating over what's right or wrong. It just sounds like we're negotiating the cost. We're, we're, we're negotiating what we're willing to put in because we're more focused on what we want to keep. Trust me, this is this is beating me up too. Because it, it just is it, it's, it's it's whooping my behind. Let me just put it back that way. And this is why I wanted to go through this 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 conversation about the lost church. Because it's topics like this that if we just slow down and ask the question, well, how did the first century church approach matters of giving? Oh. It actually puts us to shame with the debate that we're having. So give me your thoughts down there. I'm, I'm not involved in the whole tithing debate or anything like that, regardless if I, I, have, a, I have a view and a position on it. But I'm not going to get invested in it because at, reading those two chapters, chapter two and chapter four, and I would encourage you to even go further to do some homework and read chapter five, ladies and gentlemen. But... After reading those chapters, and I've read them before, and the, even even after reading them before, it was like always like, wow, how did they, how did they do that? How did they go that? How was they able to go that far? And and and, and it brings me to this conclusion. It was because they were all they had. You see, they were all they actually had. They really truly did not have anything beyond the scope of their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ for the most part, guys. See, we're not all we got. We're not all we got. The church in America is not all we got in, in, in some pockets. Some pockets, actually, that's all they got, depending on, you know what I'm saying, whatever factors. But for the most part, let's be 100, man. Let's be 100, especially in the town and the city that I live in. The church ain't all you got. And don't front like it is, because if the church was all we had, then perhaps we would be following the pattern that they were setting in the example that they were setting on the on, on, on the pathway of giving. But for us, we're not all we got. We're not. We were absolutely not. In fact, they were so close knit together and cared so much about each other. The verses that you read um, that says, 
Don't give grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves the cheerful giver and all these things. All those scriptures that you read that Paul was writing about giving um, and everything like that, I used to hear the scripture says, upon the first day of the week, let everybody lay by in stores. God is prosperous. There be, there be no gatherings when I come. And we read that in the sense of the collection of the quote unquote saints that, you know, we quote that and the collection that is passed around the plate and you put the money in for this and for that, for the property, this and for that and this and that and this. And, and, God, and we use the God loves the cheerful giver. Don't give. And we do that to kind of kind of kind of uh, 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 um, bring up the emotion welling of wanting to actually outpour into the plate. You realize Paul wasn't talking about a collection that was to stay at that local congregation that he was writing to. He was actually writing about the collection that was going to be picked up to be taken to the poor saints in Jerusalem. Let every man lay by in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come was about a collection going to Jerusalem. He was saying, I don't want to waste time when he was talking about individuals who gave out of their poverty even more. And he was he was he was uh, um, encouraging them and thanking them for that. It was because they was giving for the poor saints back in Jerusalem that the, all those scriptures that we love to quote that that actually talk about all those different things right there. I'm just simply saying we use it in the aspect of what we gather from the saints that stays in the local congregation. All those verses, I won't say all, but a high 99% majority of those verses had nothing to do with the money staying at the church that they was at. It had everything to do with being used to go hundreds of miles away to be used to aid the saints in Jerusalem. I'm just throwing it out there, ladies and gentlemen. We stand on the shoulders of giants and it will behoove us. It will behoove us to get up off our high horse of knowledge and really check our heart and actions. And I'm checking mine as I even go through this, ladies and gentlemen. Love to know your thoughts, man. Much love and respect. This is your boy, Sleep. Peace.